and I've entitled this talk uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, diabetes, drugs, scandals and serendipity because there's quite a lot of fortune attached to the discovery of these medications and in some ways a bit of a uh, fortune loss for some unscrupulous um, drug companies which we'll come on to about during the talk. But I always think talks like this and, and sort of clinical medicine uh, is helpful to start off with an illustrative case to sort of see where where these things fit in, where the role is. So um, I'd like to share with you a case of a 57 year old man who's white European in ethnicity, um, type 2 diabetes, which is diet controlled, but not very well diet controlled, giving him an HbA1c of seven point, sorry, 9.2 percent. And that's uh, sort of 77 in new money. He has a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. His ejection fraction is 28% of an ischemic etiology with appropriate scars uh, on cardiac MRI imaging to confirm that. And he came to medical attention having suffered a out of hospital cardiac arrest and then had a, a secondary prevention ICD implanted in March 2021. He has some other comorbidities, atrial fibrillation, gout and obesity. And at that time he was receiving treatment with middle dose in Tresto, Bisoprolol maximum dose, spironolactone 37.5 milligrams once daily, some amiodrone, so still having some problems with arrhythmia, uh, you know, after his cardiac arrest, and otherwise also some rivaroxaban, uh, stroke prophylaxis, uh, torvastatin 10 milligrams once daily, lanzoprazole and allopurinol. On clinical examination, he's euvolemic uh, at the time of, of this particular assessment. Pulse was 60 beats per minute and atrial fibrillation with a blood pressure of 110 over 85. Weight elevated at 147.3 kilograms, but his dry weight and a BMI of 39. Uh, also other important biochemistry, a potassium of 4.3, creatinine 99 and EGFR 68. So, sorry, that's probably a bit loud. Let me see if I can... <laughs> So, um, have a little think um, with that case what you might do next. So, I'm putting to you options that you could increase his succubital valsartan to the top dose, you could increase his spironolactone up a little bit to 50 milligrams once a day, you could start an SGLT2 inhibitor dapagliflozin 10 milligrams once daily. Um, and, you know, this sort of clue is in the title as well as, <laughs> as to what might be, uh, you know, the, the, the the preferred option in the end, um, or perhaps offer him an atrial fibrillation ablation. So consider those options in your mind, and at the end of my talk, we'll see if perhaps you know what what you were thinking of doing is the same as um, as, as what we we put forward and why. So introducing you to something that I'm sure you'll be familiar with is the unrelenting march of diabetes. So if we compare from the 1980s to 2014, so not even particularly current data, we can see there's been an explosion, an increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, um, particularly related to a reduction in physical activity in the general population and, and an increase in, in weight and abdominal circumference. So as as you i'm sure you know this is this is currently and is going to be an increasing comorbidity uh, that we're managing in line with heart failure and other cardiovascular conditions and you know at medical school i you know thought i learnt but actually didn't learn in fact that um Diabetes being a cardiovascular risk factor, if you're able to adequately control cardiovascular risk factors, you'll reduce the risk of important major adverse cardiac events like stroke and heart attack. But subsequently, uh, what I learned is that's, that's very true for things like stopping smoking and blood pressure reduction. These are potent uh, mechanisms to reduce risk of stroke and heart attack. But when it comes to control of diabetes, the better control of blood sugars benefits the microvascular complications of diabetes, which is very important. We want to prevent blindness, we want to prevent limb amputation, and poorly controlled diabetes are the leading causes of those diseases in the UK. But in fairness, using any using mostly you know sort of diabetes medications few of them are associated with a cardiovascular benefit that is a specific reduction in um risk of stroke or risk of of um, heart attack so that's quite curious despite these agents perhaps being potent in helping to control diabetes they're not particularly um cardiac beneficial mm -hmm. 
we can what we can talk about is the the two groups of diabetes medications that are that do have you know quite potent and um positive evidence of being able to influence cardiovascular risk and being able to treat heart failure, being able to reduce risk of coronary artery disease. Or just to remind anyone who's not on mute at the moment, if you just make sure that your microphone is muted, um, just because uh, we can just hear a few people in the background. Um, so SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, good for the heart and probably the only two proven classes of diabetic treatment that do have uh, clear cardiovascular benefit. Then we're, I'm going to sort of lead you through a little bit of a story about thiazolidine diones, so the glitazones, pyoglitazone, rosiglitazone, because they were shown to um, precipitate edema and worsening heart failure, heart failure hospitalisation. So those now you don't really see in clinical practice because of their negative consequences to the cardiovascular system. And most other treatments are, are neutral, including insulin and, and, and other agents that are effective in controlling HbA1cs and blood sugars. So a brief uh, look through history and the lessons learned from 1999 uh, to 2008. Um, and this is now about the, these glitazone medications. So rosiglitazone uh, was approved by the FDA in 1999 and the European Medicines Association in 2000. So FDA, um, I think uh, Federal Drug Asso uh, Association, an uh, American uh, company for the treatment of diabetes. However, there were signals that this medication was causing fluid retention and heart failure as, as recognised problems. Um, and then initial studies at that time had indicated with rosiglitazone, there was a, a, an unfavourable increase in LDL cholesterol of about 18% and a suggestion that there may be a hazard of acute myocardial infarction. So a, a sort of, a, you know, almost 80% increase in risk of of acute MI, but actually that was not statistically significant in the early studies. So this uh, confidence interval crossed one. So we couldn't be sure that necessarily this um, th this warning sign was was true and would require further monitoring. Oh, sorry about this. Uh... Right, so um, later on, the uh, European Medicines Association demanded that in order to be sure that rosiglitazone and other similar drugs had a proven adequate cardiovascular safety record, as a condition to their approval, uh, there had to be prospective trials ongoing to look into this. And there was one published in The Lancet in 2009 that is, is sort of marred in a bit of controversy in how it's presented its results. But effectively, it took nine years after drug approval before the publication of, of record of looking at rosiglitazone and suggested that um, you know, perhaps at that time there was still no clear signal of uh, cardiovascular harm and, and things continued. But in fact, prior to that, so four years prior, the WHO, World Health Organization, requested that a meta-analysis be performed. So, you know, to get some early data about rosiglitazone from GlaxoSmithKline about cardiovascular harm. And again, at that time, they found a hazard ratio for uh, negative sort of cardiovascular endpoints and so cardiovascular harm, but not statistically significant at that time. Repeated a year later with the inclusion of five more trials, they now have found statistical significance with a you know sort of thirty one percent increase in uh, events in, in usually a um, myocardial infarction, heart failure, hospitalisation. That's now showing statistical significance. But this data, importantly, was held as confidential. So WHO commissioned, performed. Um, by GlaxoSmithKline, by the drug companies, but held as confidential and not notifying the Food and Drug Administration of America or the European Medicine Association. So um, bad practice, essentially putting patients potentially at harm, having come to learn this, this harm and this problem. So that's the scandal aspect of it. In 2004, GlaxoSmithKline was, was taken to court and sued. Um, at that time, it was for off-label promotion of a different medication for paroxetine, using it in children and adolescents without disclosing data about you know, safety with, with respect to suicide risk. But later, when they discovered 
what they'd done with rosiglitazone in the suppression of data about risk of, of MI and heart failure exacerbation. This was then included in the in the lawsuit. And this is the largest settlement any drug company has ever paid to date of three billion, not to lose the case, but to effectively settle and say, right, this is the amount that we'll pay just to make this go away, essentially. And of course, we'll withdraw our drug from the market. But as well as that, one of the conditions of this settlement is that Glaxo SmithKline had to release all patient level data of all their trials. Um, and so um, groups uh, took advantage of this essentially quite quite rightly and quite reasonably to take GlaxoSmithKline's Glaxo own data and look more closely at the risk of myocardial infarction and death from cardiovascular causes with rosiglitazone and the glitazones and here found similar to the um, review from the WHO in 2005 this 43 percent increase in acute myocardial infarction which was statistically significant but a non-significant increase in cardiovascular death. So in 2008 the FDA changed its position a year after the release of this paper to say, right, no more should we, should we find ourselves putting patients, diabetic patients, high-risk patients at risk of cardiovascular events. Any new anti-diabetic drug must be pre-approved, have both pre-approval and post-approval follow-up studies to rule out excessive cardiovascular risk to protect these, these high-risk and vulnerable patients. And so enter that space now what are thought to be initially diabetic drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, known to block um, sort of sodium or glucose and uh, sodium resorption in the kidney, but seemingly now to have sort of mysterious other multi-beneficial effects. In the way that they allow a diuresis of glucose, they have been shown to reduce HbA1c and, and, and blood sugar, but and only by modest amounts. So this one of these initial trials, one of these first trials using um, SGLT2s and looking specifically at cardiovascular outcomes and mortality in type 2 diabetes. This Emperor Reg outcome was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. A total cohort of over 7,000 patients all diabetic with significant cardiovascular risk. So usually prior history of cardiovascular disease um, off about 11% having some element of diabetic nephropathy, um, but most patients adequately treated with ACE inhibitors, ARBs and statins. Um, showing that there's, you know, even at the low dose, but not particularly increased by very much with the high dose, by 12 weeks, a half a percent drop in HbA1c, a small reduction in systolic blood pressure of up to five millimetres of mercury in people who generally have the blood pressure to spend with an average of blood pressure of 135 over 77. But here, most impressively, what they found looking at this this primary endpoint they're looking at, at cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, an impressive 14% reduction in, in the combined primary outcome, statistically significant, a 38% reduction in cardiovascular death, very impressive, and again, a sort of 32 percent reduction in total mortality um, using either one of these dosages of, of empagliflozin, in 10 milligrams or 25 milligrams. No clear benefit in, in going higher in the dose in this particular study. So you had to have diabetes to be in this study. You had to have prior cardiovascular disease. Um, looking through the small print, about 10% of this population had heart failure. So not a heart failure study, uh, but a minority of patients captured in this with the reduction in all cause mortality quite impressive number needed to treat to benefit one patient is 39 to save a life and you know 46 to save a life from a, a cardiovascular uh, reason so next study I'd like to sort of introduce you to or the sort of next evolution four years later was a, a heart failure specific study DAPR HF uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. This is a study that included nearly 5,000 patients who had heart failure and reduced ejection fraction with an EF of less than 40. Not all had to have diabetes, so about half didn't, you know, 45% did, so a bit more than half didn't have diabetes. And again, we're seeing as a not now, as a non-diabetic drug, as a heart failure drug, we're seeing a, an impressive 
26% reduction in a composite endpoint of cardiovascular death and worsening heart failure. We're getting a 25% reduction in cardiovascular death or hospitalisation and a 17% reduction in death from any cause. Life-saving prognostic drug um, seen in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction regardless of whether they have type 2 diabetes or not. Um, so very impressive with a typical blood pressure reduction, a bit more modest than the Emperor Reg outcome study of two to four millimetres of, uh, of mercury systolic and one to two diastolic. And again, as I'll show you in later slides, it's more about what you have to spend as to how much blood pressure it's going to take off you. But impressively, you know, reduction in heart failure hospitalisation, 25 percent, you know, really useful um, arrow in the quiver for treating heart failure. Very safe drug as well. So interestingly, lots of things about SGLT2 inhibitors have been, you know, a concern. Fournier's gangrene, risk of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, risk of hypoglycemia. And you see when it comes to hypoglycemia, there's no difference between dapagliflozin and placebo. Um, when it comes to Fournier's gangrene, fracture, infection, you're, we're not seeing a, a significant rise. The exception here will be in thrush genital infection, where there is still quite a rare signal for that to occur with dapagliflozin. Um, but uh, that's, you know, probably the only take home message is, is sort of fungal um, candidal genital infection is the thing to caution patients about because actually, you know, the blood pressure reduction here in DAPA-HF up to two millimetres of mercury systolic, but we see three cases out of 2,000 of diabetic ketoacidosis exclusively in the type 2 diabetic patients, so those of those 45%. Um, and, you know, there, there are sort of risk markers of people who have um, closer, more tightly controlled HbA1c's who are at greater risk um, of, of that complication. And it being euglycemic makes it slightly more challenging to diagnose. And again, the HbA1c reduction fairly modest. So in this study, 0.2%. Um, and as you'd expect in placebo, there's not a reduction there. So talking about blood pressure, well, interestingly, the more you have to, to spend, for example, systolic of 130, you might expect dapagliflozin to drop the systolic blood pressure by four millimetres of mercury. But if actually your blood pressure starts off low, less than 110, then actually this medication is still relatively safe and well tolerated, though you might lose you know, two millimetres of mercury rather than four. Interestingly, the effect here over time tends to to, to lose. And this is also true of its HbA1c control and its effect on increasing serum creatinine or dropping EGFR. It's most likely to, to reach its, its largest magnitude in the first two, four weeks. But after four weeks, you'll see a recovery and things trending back to baseline, almost showing that the effect of the SGLT2 is, is sort of wearing off. But interestingly, that's only for things like hypotension, uh, creatinine impact, uh, deterioration and HbA1c lowering. It's not for the heart failure hospitalization. Uh, it's not for the good uh, outcomes that seem to you know, persist long term and then the renal protection as well, which we'll come to. Um, not only is it a drug that's fantastic for prognosis, it's a drug that's really good for improving quality of life. So, you know, putting putting quality back into the years as well as, you know, years back into to life as well. So this is a study showing a, a 3.7 point improvement uh, over 12 weeks in the Kansas City um, cardiomyopathy questionnaire. And that seems to be felt in both symptom score and general quality of life. Uh, with with less physical limitation. So a, a drug that when you compare it head to head with something like Secubitrol Valsartan seems to be promoting its quality of life improvement earlier than uh, Secubitrol Valsartan was, was sort of tested to do, but they were specifically asking their questionnaires a little bit later. Um, but also the, the magnitude of, of point improvement or score improvement seems to be comparable, if not a little bit higher. So, you know, again, a drug that can make your patients feel better um, relatively soon, so within three months after starting to take it at a statistically significant level. So then uh, entering the field and looking a little bit more about other benefits outside of heart failure, looking at renal benefits as well, uh, start off with empagliflozin in the Emperor Reduced trial. So now we're in 2020, again, published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, a study recruiting um, 
I can't remember how many patients in this study, but uh, oh, nearly nearly 4,000, so 3,730 patients, all heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, again, you know, some with diabetes, some without, uh, no sort of qualifier there that they had to have diabetes, but showing a reduction of 25% in a composite endpoint of hospitalisation and cardiovascular death, 30% reduction in heart failure hospitalisation, and a reduction in the rate of decline of EGFR. So patients on placebo will have a natural drop in EGFR over time, and this is reduced, this is um, made less steep you know, uh, with the introduction of this medication, hopefully you know, aiming to avoid patients coming to require renal replacement therapy. So you know, powerful study, again, showing a different SGLT2 inhibitor than dapagliflozin, tested in a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction population, showing benefit from a heart failure outcome perspective, but also first time demonstrated benefit from a renal perspective too. Did you join in, I thought rather than you try and find it, it took me yeah. a minute. Oh, and, yeah. So um, now sort of moving on, looking at specifically in uh, chronic kidney disease, taking a look outside of heart failure, we can see that these SGLT2 inhibitors have now been tested in a chronic kidney disease population. So this study, DAPA-CKD, of over 4,000 patients with EGFRs varying from 25 to 75, but the majority of whom had type 2 diabetes, so 67%, but they were albuminuric. So they had to have a, an a albumin to creatinine ratio elevated at 200 to 5,000 and, uh, and have this uh, de definition of, of being uh, diagnosed with CKD. And we see that with 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin, there's again a reduction, a statistically significant reduction in a composite outcome of cardiovascular hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular death, as well as a reduction in the decline of EGFR by at least 50%, the development of end-stage chronic kidney disease and the requirement of, of renal replacement therapy. So again, powerful signs that in patients with chronic kidney disease, um, this medication is, is life-saving and life-prolonging and kidney-prolonging. In this particular study, 11% had heart failure at baseline, but they did specifically ex exclude patients uh, with NYHA class 4. But 37% had a history of cardiovascular disease, so quite a high-risk population getting quite a dramatic benefit from dapagliflozin. So in, in some ways, this, is, this SGLT2 story has been one of scientific replication. Although these are new drugs licensed for heart failure, not yet licensed for chronic kidney disease, but I would suggest we watch this space as that seems to be very likely um, to be cost effective and of benefit to a wider community of patients. But although they're new to us, we could consider that these studies have now been going on for some time and many of them have reproduced the same findings. So there's a lot of consistency across these studies. We can see that we're not necessarily having to stick to one SGLT2 inhibitor. We're seeing that different SGLT2 inhibitors are being tested here and all showing sort of similar benefit, particularly when it comes to things like heart failure, hospitalization, which is quite a consistent benefit of a drop in about 25 to 30% across all of these groups. But we're also seeing that some of these studies are sort of targeted to specific populations. So you can see the earlier trials are diabetic patients. Then we've got Credence, for example, is diabetic and chronic kidney disease. We've got Emperor Reduced Dapper HF, which is just heart failure, and Soloist, which is heart failure and diabetes. Now we've got chronic kidney disease and diabetes studies um, conducted in SCORED and you know solely chronic kidney disease study in DAPA CKD, all of which so showing quite dramatic benefit of SGLT2s in these populations, some of them mixed, some of them, you know, solely diabetic or heart failure or CKD in their design. So looking at the renal perspective, again, you know, whether it's a, a CKD study in DAPA CKD or whether it's a heart failure study in DAPA HF or Emperor Reduced, quite remarkably consistent um, gentling off of this slope of normal aging renal decline that happens in the placebo group, we see that as you extend the time, you know, at 24 months in DAPA HF, you just saw that the, the DAPA line was coming, you know, reaching back towards the placebo. But by 31 months, we see that it's better to be on impagliflozin than it is on placebo, because at 31 months, your kidney function and the decline of your kidney function has been less on an SGLT2 than it would have been with you taking no 
SGLT2. And then at 36 months on DAPA CKD, we can see that the lines, you know, sort of crossed a while ago and that, you know, this really has gentle, made a far more gentle slope of, you know, renal function over time compared to not taking this drug. So again, you know, really sort of potential to use this drug in CKD patients in the future, although it's not yet licensed, but that's a big population that sits outside um, and is likely to benefit. So as with all things, when you come to learn about a drug that's very clinically effective, the first step is having the evidence. But there is a, you know, a, a journey and a pathway along to overcome sort of clinical inertia. Part of that is enhancing knowledge. So what I'm doing today and I'm continue to do, and I'm sure you will continue to do with your patients and, and in your hospitals, to eventually make sure that this translates to better patient care. And ultimately, you know, one day we'll be saying rather than, oh, should we start an SGLT2 for this patient? It's why are we not starting an SGLT2? There just seems to be so many organ systems it's benefiting. And, you know, as I'll sort of point to later, whether you've got heart failure with pre reduced ejection fraction or now even with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there looks like the benefits can, can translate. Um, you will have probably noticed in the recent ESC heart failure guidelines that there's a slight rejigging of, of how best we should be up titrating and optimizing heart failure therapy that maybe our original conventional sequencing and you know getting everything up to better dosages and then adding a new agent or waiting for patients to continue to be symptomatic before adding in a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist is kind of holding us back and stopping patients getting the benefit of a reduction in heart failure hospitalization if it's taking us several months to get these drugs on board. So, you know, we're now looking at regimens where we're trying to, you know, introduce these medications earlier, make sure patients are getting the prognostic and symptomatic benefit. And arguably, SGLT2 inhibitors can find themselves to have quite an early place in treatment on the basis that they're relatively benign, affecting blood pressure, they're not going to reduce heart rate, they're probably the only drug class, maybe other than beta blockers, that aren't really going to affect the kidney function. And if anything, although there might be an early four week drop, you would expect that after you know, 30 weeks, you're protecting the kidneys and perhaps able to get you know, more other prognostic medications on board. So, you know, we're looking to say, you know, in terms of what order do you introduce medications in? This is one that could come early because, you know, we're, we're having to worry a little bit less about effects of blood pressure. We're hoping that although we might see an early decline of, of, of sort of two to four mils per minute in EGFR in the first four weeks, beyond that, we are better off being on this drug with renal impairment than not being on this drug. Again, you know, provided it fits in with the um, indications of the study or, or and the EGFR is, is better than 30 for dapagliflozin. So I, I put it to you that this is a rare and game-changing triple benefit uh, of these SGLT2 inhibitors because for the heart, you've got a reduction in cardiovascular death, a reduction in non-fatal MI, a reduction in non-fatal stroke, and although it's modest, some degree of blood pressure reduction, more for those people who have you know, higher blood pressures to spend. For the pancreas, yes, you're getting a reduction in glucose control. So for diabetes, you're getting a maybe on average 0.4% reduction in HbA1c. It can help you lose weight. That's often important to a lot of patients. So up to two kilograms of weight loss might be achieved with this medication. And this is it. If you don't have diabetes, but you have heart failure, your risk of developing diabetes after being introduced to this drug drops by nearly a third. So these medications, in some ways, if you've got heart failure, it treats heart failure. If you've got diabetes, it treats diabetes. If you've got chronic kidney disease, it treats that by reducing pro progression of that. But if you don't have heart failure, but you've got high cardiovascular risk, it protects you and prevents you from getting heart failure. If you don't have diabetes, it protects you from getting diabetes. And if your kidneys work fine, it ensures and protects your kidneys in the long term compared to placebo. As in the kidneys, as I said, we're reducing the rate of renal decline. It's reducing the need for dialysis, very important to patients, particularly you know, cardiorenal patients as they get older, fear that up titration of their medications is going to commit them to uh, you know, all the procedures of, of dialysis and three times a weekly trips to hospital. So this is a, a, another big benefit and a, and a big advantage for heart failure patients um, who still have an EGFR of greater than 30. But also, you know, if we're struggling 
struggling to uptight trait because of hyperkalemia. It reduces the, the, the incidence of hyperkalemia by about 50%. So another good drug in order to allow the um, uh, RNE or ACE inhibitor or MRA to be uptitrated by having this on board. So if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to share with you a brief uh, sort of sports metaphor about this drug. That one bounced. Donaldson has it. Third, second, yes! first triple play. A triple play for the A's, and that ends the <laughs> inning. Brett Henderson said, wow, come right back and turn a triple play. How great is that? Eighth triple play in Oakland history. Last one was we've showed the Randy Velarde unassisted triple play. Triple plays in baseball don't happen all that often. They'd probably be once every sort of few seasons generate a tremendous amount of excitement. And I think that's that that's a reasonable place for us to view these SGLT2 inhibitors, how they're benefiting three organ systems at once. And even if you don't have problems with those organ systems, you're getting protection from from those problems in the future. From a practical level, we need to warn patients about a risk of uh, gentle thrush infection. Um, people say that it can be improved with good personal hygiene, but I found it's a difficult conversation to have. If someone's never had thrush before, you start them on this medication and they develop it for, for you to say, well, it's it's because you're you're just not taking care of, of, of cleanliness after going to the toilet before, because quite naturally people will say, well, no, it's the, the drug that you gave me, uh, which is true. Um, so it's usually a one-off. It will be treatable with, with canistin or any thrush treatment. Um, and, and as I say, relatively rare, maybe about one in 500 patients might suffer this complication. There's a mild increase in diuresis. So normally you can counsel patients. It's, it's sort of one extra trip to the toilet to pass water rather than being a very powerful diuretic like fruzamide, which often puts puts patient off the idea of additional diuretics. It's useful and important to warn patients about sick day rules. So particularly those with diabetes, but in fairness, all patients should be told that if they're suffering they're very unwell with diabetes, dehydration, severe infection requiring intravenous antibiotic treatment, vomiting, abdominal pain, then they should stop this medication to avoid a complication and only restart it when they're feeling back to normal. Renal function should be checked after sort of two to four weeks of initiating this medication, then probably reasonably at two months and then four monthly. But what do you do with the result? Because often is the case, it's, it's best to just sit on your hands. Because if after the first four weeks you see a decline, provided it's not dropping the EGFR less than 30, for example, or it's not a dramatic drop, um, then actually holding your nerve will mean that in the long term these patients are going to benefit. Um, Interesting questions often arise about volume status. So should the uh, frozen might be stopped or reduced at a time of introducing dapaglifers in a bit, you know, how, uh, similar to how we felt when getting to grips with uh, secubitral valsartan for the first time. But it looks in these studies that maybe only one in 10 patients were finding that this was, you know, particularly additive in managing fluid status and, and requiring a reduction in diuretic. Otherwise, it's probably sensible just to carry on doing with the diuretic and continuing the diuretic as you normally would and then waiting for the next fluid status review to decide you know how things are going and when you tell things back rather than having any automatic approach to starting this medication and doing anything with the diuretic and in diabetes if you've got an hba1c less than seven or 53 in new money then you're at risk of maybe dropping the blood pressure too low sorry dropping the blood glucose too low introducing this medication without first reviewing whether the insulin dose should be reduced by 10 to 20 percent or the sulfonylurea dose, the glycoside dose being reduced by 25 to 50 percent if i'm completely honest i do involve the diabetes team or the patient's gp kind of at the time I'm considering introduction from the basis that I feel, look, I'm probably not going to be the person long term managing your diabetes. And therefore, it would be better if it were a group decision that we're reducing your insulin or your glycoside in order to facilitate you receiving this heart failure reno protective drug. Um, that being said, if you're on metformin, um, if you're on other agents, then it, it doesn't tend to be an issue. So it's, it's kind of sulfonylureas and insulin. Who shouldn't you start an SGLT2 on? Type 1 diabetics, because at the moment it's not licensed and there probably will be a higher risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, caution in patients with diabetes and type 2 diabetes, but they've had previous DKA, so severe admissions, for example. If you're very hypotensive and symptomatic or your, your systolic blood pressure is consistently below 90, you probably won't 
get it tolerated that easily and severe renal failure. So not licensed if the EGFR is less than 30, but there has been some empagliflozin uh, studies and data suggesting that maybe even down to 20, you're still getting reno protective benefit, but that's a little bit more um, controversial. So think about who, who's eligible for this drug. And, and at the moment, if you imagine, we see patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with or without diabetes, we can start it on them. There are diabetic patients who are potentially benefiting, particularly those with cardiovascular risk factors that could be started by GPs or by diabetologists. But there's a huge number of chronic kidney disease patients out there for which this isn't yet licensed, but most of them are not seen by di uh, by nephrologists because they're, they're nowhere near approaching dialysis or not suitable for dialysis. But there's a potential huge swell of patients out there in primary care that could get a reduction in their renal decline with this drug. And I wouldn't be surprised in the future whether, you know, we start seeing this being used more widely. And this, you know, it perhaps is well placed in primary care on the basis that those doctors will see a lot of these patients and perhaps many of these patients will not necessarily come to our clinics or come to our attention. So the more education and the more we sort of share the love and spread the love about SGLT2s, the better it is for the community of patients out there that could benefit. So um, I'm going to wrap up very soon because I think I've just got the last few slides that I'll scramble through. But just to let you know, there are more studies ongoing, some in HEFPEF, I've got some data on the, the latest ones, some cardiorenal patients, acute heart failure, post-MI settings to see if there's additional benefit and the, the power of benefit there. Emperor Preserved is this new and exciting study that although there doesn't seem to be a mortality benefit in heart failure patients with preserved ejection fraction, whether they've got diabetes or not, there is a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, which is statistically significant and about the uh, sort of 21% mark in reduction of heart failure hospitalization. So a drug we may soon be using if it becomes licensed in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and it probably is quite cost effective um, if we're using it for that indication, but time will tell, we'll see. So coming back to this uh, original question about this person, sorry, I'll see if I can try and turn it down. There, this person mentioned um, with diabetes, I would put it to you that the dapagliflozin is the best agent to start now that's going to help with weight, weight reduction, as well as all those other benefits we've talked about, how it's going to help reduction in heart failure hospitalization, treat the heart failure, it's going to protect the kidneys in the long term. So now, given that my time is up, I'm going to go to questions and hopefully not eat into too much of Gail's time. Thank you so much, Andy. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so, yes, any questions? So, Susan. Hi, uh, yeah, it's, um, thank you for the presentation, it's really, really helpful. Um, it's not really a question, it's more kind of a thing that we have in the community, because obviously we have to follow our network guidance for the prescribing, and it's easy when we get non-diabetic, it's fine. We have to initiate the prescription. Once they've been on it, we can then ask the GP to go on after that, because it's still an amber two. Um, but the problem that we have is when we have a diabetic patient who may be on one or two agents, um, and they say, OK, get diabetes advice. A lot of the patients in the community don't have a diabetologist. They're seen by the practice nurse. And then we're kind of left in a quandary of what do we do? Because we've been told to seek advice from a diabetes doctor. We don't have one necessarily who knows the patient. Sometimes we, if we ask our um, consultant cardiologist and they're happy, they will give advice. We can then pass that on to the GP. With that, some GPs are happy to do it. Some GPs still know. Um, we've got a lot of discrepancy with the information that the GPs in the community seem to have about it. And I just kind of wanted to raise it and see what if what the thoughts were about that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I just think we, well, I mean, even when, when we were starting to introduce this drug to inpatients, there was a lot of talk across, okay, can we have a diabetes lead and a renal lead to talk to, through, you know, specific you know, uh, circumstances that might crop up and how best to advise. But I guess with all these new agents, you know, certain people know what has happened in those clinical trials that have been run and what the safety is. But that information just takes a while to, to spread out to people. I do, I sort of share your your um, 
frustration with this as well in that you know sometimes there isn't really a, a sort of clear person who feels comfortable to make new changes in someone's diabetic regimen but what this is effectively is mostly i mean it's just so that i guess what i've sort of tried to put across is this, there's so much benefit that lies outside of diabetes with this drug that even the small diabetes benefit means that if we could convince someone who's who's kind of interested in taking on the patient's diabetes to substitute this in for perhaps something else that the patient's currently on that might be you know only helping with the diabetes control but not necessarily giving all these additional benefits and we can introduce this safely without worrying that its introduction has l resulted in hypoglycemia that's that's you know caused the patient problems then you know that would be an advantage i think with time these things will come i think it's just with all these things we'll always find that there's just a slow proliferation of experience and education and understanding and over time as well as gps practice nurses diabetic practitioners will just see more and more patients on this and become more comfortable that it doesn't lower blood sugar that much. You know, there'll be some things like GLP-1 receptor agonists that are used in diabetes. There aren't that many studies that look at co-administration with SGLT2. So what they say is if you've got a lot of cardiovascular risk, but you don't have heart failure, maybe the GPL uh, one receptor agonists are maybe better for that diabetic patient. But if you've got heart failure, which is the population we deal with, then probably dump the GPL1 receptor agonists and go with DAPA instead. And patients will like it because the majority, uh, some of these GPL1 receptor agonists aren't oral medications, they're injectables. And if you tell a patient, well, you don't have to inject, you, and we'll give you this tablet instead, most of them would approve. So some of them may just be winners for the patient as well. And I just think that CKD population who stand to benefit, and there's so many of them out there, I just wonder one day when that gets licensed and that gets kind of heavily promoted in general practice, where a lot of those patients will live, we might then end up, you know, seeing the patient with heart failure, but they're actually already on this drug because they've got some proteinuric chronic kidney disease, because that's probably the largest population sitting out there untreated with SGLT2 inhibitors that might benefit. But we have to see what the renal societies do. So I think more time, um, more usage, more experience, and, and hopefully we'll overcome those. But I think you're right. I think probably for the next couple of years, we just have to accept that there will be, you know, tricky you know, uh, negotiations and things we have to try and do to convince people to get diabetics who might have a little bit borderline uh, HbA1c in terms of borderline low to get them to change their medications. I get if the HbA1c is very high, you're pretty safe because I, in that case, I probably, if I was finding that I was struggling to get anyone looking after the patient's diabetes to make a decision on it, uh, exactly as you pointed out, when you take it to your cardiologist, they'll probably say, look, HbA1c has been nine for several months. We're just going to add this into their other regimen of drugs because clearly they need more control and this is going to help with that. It's going to help their kidneys, it's going to help their, their heart as well. Just Brilliant, to jump thank you. To so just to jump in and say there is a new South East London guideline that's being approved in the process of being approved for diabetes and apocalypticin and it's got a really nice flow chart of when it can just be started when you should refer to the diabetic team so hopefully when that when that comes out it will help in these situations where it might be a little bit less clear cut. Perfect and I think yeah probably you know 80% of patients will kind of probably go down the pathway that you could just say look start it and you don't need to change anything else and that will simplify things for for everyone. Um, hello, just one question. Um, basically, um, I, the risk has been mentioned as, um, you know, genital trash. Um, is it suitable for the patients, you know, who get the recurrent UTI? Um, is there a risk of uh, getting, you know, yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Because these trials were done in diabetic patients, it was not uncommon for them to find patients who had recurrent UTIs and, and perhaps were chronically on antimicrobial prophylaxis. When it comes to bacterial urinary infections, so these recurrent UTIs, it doesn't appear that dapagliflozin increases that at all or increases the risk. So we can be quite uh, sort of exclusive in saying this could be a problem for patients with recurrent genital thrush infections. But if you're a recurrent UTI patient, for example, on long-term nitrofurantoin, 
actually there's no reason that this drug would cause you problems or increase your risk of UTI infections. With ongoing long-term surveillance, all these things are up for you know changing and reviewing. But so far from these large, and as you've seen, I've shown you there's sort of multiple thousands of patients of studies. Many of them would have had potential problems with recurrent bacterial urinary tract infections, and none of them seem to show that introducing SGLT2 inhibitors was a problem with bacterial urinary tract infections. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Uh, and we've got uh, somebody with a question in the comments. Um, is it right that patient with CKD plus heart failure can have DAPA if the EGFR is less than 15, prescribing from a CKD point of view? Sorry, greater than 15. Can have DAPA if EGFR greater than 15, prescribing from a CKD point of view? So I think this uh, EGFR range of sort of 15 to 30, we don't have a lot of data on, and we probably need to look to our renal physician colleagues to see what their views are in terms of what could be the benefit for this patient outside of those trials that have currently been conducted, because those current trials we have don't include patients with EGFRs in that sort of 15 to 30 category. If the EGFR is above 30, then you're absolutely right. Uh, they, you know, there seems to be benefit whether you're looking at a you know, predominantly CKD study. EGFR greater than 35 looks like it's a good thing to do and ultimately in the long term better than being on placebo, being on an SGLT2. But I would just say that 15 to 30 range, we don't have data on. So it, I'm not necessarily saying absolutely no. I'm just saying we're in a position where we'd probably need to talk to the nephrologist to say, well, clearly we don't have the evidence to know in this group it's completely safe. But in the face of what we're dealing with or what we're treating or, or you know, what we're trying to achieve, as we've as has been done with other drugs, although they've not specifically been licensed in patients with very low EGFRs who were approaching dialysis, you know, we do have dialysis patients on cardiovascular drugs that, you know, have not been like well tested in that community. So I would say, yeah, the 15 to 30, I wouldn't start kind of without good discussion with the, with the renal team, but above 30, yes. Uh, Yolanta, you've got a question. Yeah, um, hi, Andrew. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I've got a question uh, with regards to the uh, case which you presented at the very beginning. Um, and I believe there was someone with ischemic cardiomyopathy, as long as I remember, uh, who, who had a background of diabetes hypertension. I know that uh, there's been still a lot of confusion uh, among the clinicians which one uh, to use for a particular patient, would UNPA be better, would DAPA be better? And uh, I work in St. George's, and um, I've, we've been told that, you know, for someone with a background of uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy and someone who is a diabetic and he's got lots of risk factors, MPA would probably have uh, more benefits. Um, uh, we haven't got a sort of structure pathway yet, but um, I wonder whether you could comment on that uh, from your sort of experience and, and point of view. Yeah, it's a very good question. And to be honest, I don't know. And it's something I'll certainly go away and look into a little bit further. But my reading of all the trial data so far is at the present time, nobody's really been sort of or a profile of patient hasn't really been selected out um, to this stage where they might benefit from one particular type of SGLT2 inhibitor compared to another. My view, I guess, is with EMPA, you've got the ability to go up from a dose of 10 milligrams once a day to 25 milligrams once a day. So one might argue, because that particular case I presented had a very poor control of HbA1c and good renal function, perhaps the 25 of EMPA is a better choice for that individual patient than 10 of DAPA because you're just able to get more SGLT2 into the patient. I just have haven't seen any data that would necessarily say that even though the two haven't been compared head to head, there was necessarily a clear benefit. It would look like if, if what you're seeking to do is reduce heart failure hospitalization by about 30%, I haven't seen any evidence that will say MPA25 will do that any better than DAPA10. I can see that the MPA25 might lower the blood pressure a little bit more, might reduce the HbA1c a little bit more, 
but not necessarily for the heart failure or the renal decline in function have that specific benefit. But I may need to go back to some of these trials and have a look in a little bit more detail. We may see over time that, that some of those trials do herald other signals. And one of the interesting SGLT2 inhibitors is sotaglyphosin, because as well as blocking SGLT2, it blocks SGLT1. And some people have felt that there may be additional gains and additional you know, sort of prognostic benefit that's achieved if you're maybe blocking more receptors and affecting the um, kind of uh, cardio metabolic state a little more. Because as far as we understand, uh, we don't really know why these drugs work the way they do on the cardiovascular system. It seems like these are secondary benefits from a cardio metabolic perspective and a cardiac energetic perspective, but why they should come from a drug whose predominant action is on a kidney kind of receptor is a mystery. And although there's you know a few studies out there and a few basic science studies, it's still mostly conjectural. I don't think we really understand the, the sort of clear mechanism of action causing the hard cardiovascular endpoint benefits. But I think what you've raised is very interesting. And uh, yeah, the simple things I don't know, but you could have a point. Yeah, great, thank you. Any final questions before we let Andy go? And actually, you can take away that terrible photo <laughs> yeah. still on the screen. <laughs> of course, no problem. But yeah, I'm sorry to, to overrun with time. I should have perhaps just brought the presentation shorter to allow more time for questions, but I hope that hasn't thrown Gail's afternoon uh, off too much. Andy, yours is way more important than mine. Sorry. No, we'll say, yeah, thank you very, very much. That was extremely comprehensive, extremely interesting. And I think, yeah, lots of um, really relevant and valid questions um, about this really important drug that, as you say, could hopefully have an, a massive impact on, on patients' lives. So thank you very much. Um, Angie, I'm going to be in contact because, as you say, we need to spread the love and um, I'm going to be very keen for you to get this out to some of the GPs. So I will be back in touch. I'm um, perhaps about setting up some, um, some some sessions for GP for primary care for this as well. Perfect. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'm going to hand over to Gail. So I think, again, most of you probably, or some of you will know Gail. She's one of the um, specialist pharmacists at Dyson St Thomas's for heart failure and again some of you may know about this app that she's been involved in in developing called MedTap but I will hand over to Gail who will say a little bit more about, about what the app is all about and how you might be able to get it out to your patients. I hate doing that but can everyone see my screen? I'm just trying to look as silly as I can't see. Yeah no we can't we can see it okay, yes. Brilliant. So um yeah, I, my name's Gail, I'm a happy pharmacist at Geysers and Thomas's, and apologies if you've already heard me talk about this, I, um, I'm trying to kind of get the word out. So um, a little while ago I helped create um, an app called MedTap, which is an information, patient information and reminder app. So I guess just to kind of give a bit of a background as to why we might want to have something like this. Um, I'm sure as heart failure nurses, you are all fully aware of the difficulty in terms of adherence to medications um, with patients. Um, so obviously adherence is the extent to which patients' um, actions match what they're supposed to be doing. And within the UK and globally, non-adherence is a massive issue, um, but no one's really kind of managed to, to have a magic solution that kind of helps all of these patients. Um, and we know that, you know, long-term adherence to kind of patients with long-term conditions um, to their medications is poor and non-adherence can kind of fall between intentional and, and unintentional non-adherence and it, it, the reasons behind it um, can be quite complex sometimes especially if they're intentionally non-adherent um, trying to change patients health beliefs can be really difficult um, and um, it's of, often actually we're not we're not successful because of kind of long-standing beliefs that are difficult to, to, to change um, and obviously, in terms of well, any long term condition that requires medication, non adherence can lead to deterioration symptoms and hospital admission and kind of um, worse outcomes for the patient, but also there's also financial implication for NHS trusts. Um, in terms of kind of barriers to kind of good adherence, patients are perhaps a certain cohort are much more likely to listen to their friends or relatives about information um, or kind of their advice or opinions about medications and this can impact their ability to take or their desire to take them. Um, they also quite often have worries and concerns that as healthcare professionals we may not be addressing unintentionally and this can often re uh, relate to kind of how medications are used and the risk behind them so they don't necessarily always fully understand why they might need it. And obviously things like Google and everything online, they're just able to access information um, 
a lot more a lot more easily that can help um, and there's a conspiracy theory for everything so kind of to look at, there's always a reason you could find on the internet for why you shouldn't um, take medications um, so what i kind of wanted to do with developing the app was to try and have i guess in a way an evidence-based an evidence base to kind of help identify uh, with this um, problem so the idea behind medtap is we're trying to empower patients anyone that has um, looked at anything to do with health beliefs um, layers sort of a bit of a guru when it comes to adherence and looking at this kind of diagram it's helping to improve patient understanding will then improve their ability to recall that information when they need it this will also help improve the satisfaction um, with the information that they that, that they are with the information they've received and ultimately their adherence so it can be quite complicated to kind of get to the point where the adherence is improved um, and so kind of what we wanted to do was help to um, patients have quick and easy access to, to digital information uh, i'm sure in other areas we have a lot of paper information um, at guys and st thomas's that we'll be handing out um, this often tends to go in the discharge bag and then never seen again um, so wanted to have something and obviously there's lots of information already on the internet um, but quite often patients have to trawl through large amounts of information to get the specific section that they is relevant to what they're looking for or they might have to watch like long videos again to just get a very specific bit so being able to kind of have short access to information was kind of the key behind MedTap and its development. Um, so MedTap is free to download on both Apple and Android. Um, I'll, if my computer lets me, I'll try and do a little demo in a second. Um, so they, it allows kind of its patient-centered information. So all the scripts of the videos have all been written by healthcare professionals. They've been checked by the patient information team, um, and then they're available on the, um, the app for patients to review. Um, so it's obviously from a recognised source from an NHS trust um, and the idea of the videos is kind of like a consultation in your pocket so your patients are able to access it at the point when they need it the most but it's kind of repeating of the information that they would have been told. We know from um, we know from research that and the literature that the amount of information that patients retain when they're told information is, is relatively little um, so them being able to access the, the same information repeatedly should hopefully help with that understanding, recall, satisfaction and adherence. Um, so MedTap kind of, they, there's also a generic information section, so the medicine common questions. So some of the, the key questions that patients might have about the cost of their prescription or how to get further supply, which we often think is things that people would know, but quite often actually these are kind of key areas that patients do worry about and could be a cause for non-adherence. So in terms of then the conditions, what we try and break it down into is why a medicine needs to be taken with a, for that specific condition then how specifically it works. Um, then also then videos about the side effects of medicine and what patients need to do they suffer from any side effects or problems and also then just practical advice on how to take it. And this is linking back to work on the kind of um, reasons why patient or information that patients want to know that they don't necessarily think they're always told by their healthcare professionals. So um, this is gonna allow me to play it. So this is one of our videos. Um, they all follow the, they all follow the same format um, they're all kind of linked to the guys in St Thomas's YouTube channel so the patients are able to watch it through the app so this is how to monitor your symptoms of heart failure I'm just gonna try and come out of this Whoop. Let's see if I can show you a little demonstration on my phone Okay, so this is, can you, hopefully you can all still see that. So this is how MedTac comes up on the main screen um, when you when you log into the app. So I guess just to also say the information that patients put into this, into the app is not transmitted anywhere. Um, part of the reason behind that is, I, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at the tele uh, monitoring uh, trials within heart failure. They were all sort of not conclusive that they were beneficial in the long term. And obviously for a clinician perspective, there's a huge amount of work required into kind of tracking that information that comes through. So the, there's, there's still lots more information to be added um, to the app, but this is kind of how it is in, in its format currently. So we break it down. So it's not just cardiovascular, we do have some other information available as well. So for heart, your patient's got heart failure, and then these are all the, um, the videos that they can watch. So they just press play. Um, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm on the NHS Wi-Fi on my phone at the moment, which does unfortunately block the videos, but the video is just then able within, within their, um, or on their phone and they can just watch it there the video is not downloading so if they've got worries about data it shouldn't be a problem or they can just kind of use um, wi-fi wherever they are so there's a number of different heart videos available um, we also have some dermatology videos um, that have been done by guys in st thomas's 
Um, we also, having kind of worked with um, some of the other pharmacists, Fat Guys and St Thomas's that wanted some information available, we also have a number of kind of um, pills that we also have available for patients to view. Um, this is a video actually that's been, uh, that was created by Pfizer that have allowed us to kind of have it in the app, so that's how to use Dolteparin. And then we also link to some other websites. So in terms of how to use your inhalers, um, the Asthma UK has got all of them already and they're all really good. So there's no point kind of replicating. And again, patients can then um, access those through their phone. Um, the other area um, which we also have that I think is really useful, especially from a non adherence perspective, is the ability for patients to add their medications into the app. Um, so they can just add them. Again, this information doesn't kind of go anywhere. It's just all, it's all saved um, within uh, on the phone. It's not transmitted anywhere. But patients are able to kind of um, add their medicines and also helpfully, especially kind of where unintentional non adherence is a problem, set reminders. Um, so this reminder will go off with on their phone. It will come up as an alert. If they've got it on silent, it should still come up as a banner across the app saying time to take your medicines type thing. Um, and so patients, if it's just the evening ones that they're forgetting, they can kind of select. And they can you can individually edit the times of when you want to take your medication. So it can be if you want to, if you want to uh, um, edit that, you can. We also link to a number number of websites, um, and patients can if they just want to put um, separate notes in, or if they want to document their allergy status, that's all available to kind of to do within the app as well. Um, just go back to the other. So obviously I've just kind of gone through all the information at the moment. Currently in development, so I'm working with the Inherited Cardiac Conditions team, so we're currently writing the scripts for those videos um, and hopefully by the end of the year, if everything goes well, or the beginning of the new year, we should have those available. I'm also working, working with our EP team here to kind of have some cardiac devices videos, so kind of what's an ICD, CRT, um, information kind of pre and post implantment, and also we have the scripts written, we just now need to film for SGLT2s and heart failure, kind of following up on what Andy's presentation was. They're not currently available the heart failure section because they were only licensed after we'd already done the heart failure videos but that is all um, what is coming um, and um, yeah so that that's kind of what's on board to to be added next i just have a nice little case report actually so we've had some nice feedback from patients that use the app um, hopefully you would agree it's it's simple um, we've tried to really go for simplicity in terms of how to use it um, i did do a little bit of kind of because i know one of the common uh, questions or comments I get about using an app in a heart failure population is the age of patients and whether they have the ability to be able to to use an app. Um, we did a little small scale review across an, an age range, so kind of for patients from 30 up to 90. And actually, the key thing is, and I guess especially with the pandemic, most of the patients have access to a smartphone. So we kind of did a sample of 50, 48 had the had a smartphone. Um, Understandably, as the patient's age increases, kind of the, the confidence in being able to use an app diminishes. Um, but in terms of kind of just being able to offer some simple kind of in clinic, show them how to use it, um, that often seems enough to then allow them to kind of be able to use the app in their way at home. But there was just a story that we had from a, a patient that was incredibly non-adherent that was under our heart failure nurses. Um, and the idea of the app is it's it's used alongside obviously standard care because you know obviously heart failure nurses. The consultants and the pharmacists do do a great job already at kind of helping support the patient in that sense. Um, but the idea of the app is it helps to supplement that. So this patient was incredibly non-adherent. Um, she was visited by one of our pharmacists together with a heart failure nurse when they were doing their routine visit. And with their patient's permission, MedTap was installed and the medications were added and a reminder set and showed how to use the video. And then over a three-month period, obviously together with titration and using MedTap, um, there was an improvement in the patient's blood pressure. And actually kind of when they did a repeat echo at three months, it went improved from 35 to 45%. Um, give a Silipir a shout out because he was, was helping with this. Um, and the what was noted is that the patient's family started to use MedTap. Um, they, the, the family kind of were involved in helping and they used it as a game, kind of the prompted her to take her medications when the reminder flashed up on her phone. So I just thought it was a nice little story of kind of how MedTap actually can be used in practice. Through the app, there's the ability to feedback. Um, so we see, I kind of monitor the emails that come through. So if you click on the feedback, the email, it will, it will, it will automatically put it in your phone to kind of take through. And we have had a number of feedback through that. And yeah, so it's free to download, like I say, as an Apple and Android. 
um, I'm always open to suggestions, feedbacks, comment, um, comments that anybody may have about how to improve the app. Uh, if anybody would like to kind of talk about expanding the conditions or information available, um, please do get in contact. I was super quick there, Sally. I'm sorry. I've like that's ten minutes. Has anybody got any questions they would like to ask? Absolutely brilliant, um, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> I, mean, really... so quick. I wasn't trying to be that that quick. <laughs> <laughs> really comprehensive. Um, there's a, a question in the chat from, from Hayley Price-Hawkins. Will this be incorporated into the patient portal for Apollo? Which, um, for those of you who, who don't know, Apollo is the new um, electronic health record that's being implemented across King's St Thomas, well, Guys and St Thomas's and Harefield and Brompton. So I'm not sure uh, Apollo in any way. I do know that they have their own app as kind of part of the package. And I don't know what guys in St. Thomas's have signed up to in sort of in terms of that being used. Hopefully uh, there are kind of further discussions, I guess that need to take place about that. Um, I, th I think the app, I think it's called My Chart or something that's used with Epic. Um, the way, when I've seen that, that was more about clinic appointments. Um, and in terms of any changes to a medicine list that were created had to be approved by the, the doctors or the medical team, which seems unnecessarily complicated. So possibly, um, but, I guess those discussions still need to be had kind of further down the line. Thank you. Um, Yolanda, Yolanda, is that an old hand? Sorry, that's an old hand. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Susan, you've got a question. Uh, yeah, again, it was more of a comment. It was just to let you know, um, Dr. Ismail, uh, your consultant cardiologist from Thomas, as you know, he comes out and he does some community yep. yeah. cardiac clinics. So he told me about the app. So I've actually got it on my phone. And then what I do, if I see somebody, um, because you know, affects is predominantly an elderly uh, population. However, they do quite often have um, helpful sons, daughters, etc. cetera. Um, I can then show them that on my phone. And then if they think that that would be useful, they can then, if mum or dad hasn't got a phone, they then download it on theirs, like you were saying with your case study. So it was just to let you know that the community are aware of the app. Um, and hopefully, yeah, you, you may get more people who are getting on board with it. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, Epic has been super <laughs> important in the process of developing Med MedTapi um, has, has helped me a huge amount. We're, we're looking also to try and get some some funding to kind of try and do a, a proper research trial to see whether actually it helps improve not only adherence but I guess patient knowledge um, patient is there any change in their health beliefs um, and, and are we able to kind of get the medicines on quicker if we're in, improving that um, adherence from the patient perspective so I'm pleased to hear that you're using it thank you. Um, I, I, yeah, I think, Susan, lots of people have found it's been very helpful having it on their phone. Yes, yeah, so practitioners have got it on their phone and can then show the patient um, and then help them actually download it um, while they're in clinic, which I think has been very successful. Um, Philip, Philip here, a question from you. Uh, it's, it's more a, a response, really. Um, as, as part of the Apollo thing, we've sent it quite a bit across to the patient experience team, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, we've asked for links to patient information um, to be included within the patient experience portal. So, and and MedTap could be one of those links, I guess. I see. Maybe liaise with you about that further. Then. <laughs> maybe liaise with you about that further. <laughs> Sorry, he's sitting next to me. That's why we're like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think one of the other things that's been suggested, actually I, already it's happening already, hasn't it, um, Gail, that on the clinic letters, um, no, it's the inpatient letters, isn't it? Inpatient discharge letters have um, links to the um, to MedTap and we're trying to put those into the outpatient letters as well at the moment so that patients have again, got that physically on their on their documentation that's coming out from the hospital. Yeah, so my research is really in St Thomas's, so it's on the discharge letter. Um, for patients at Guys and St Thomas's, there's just kind of on the old blurb that it's back. There's on the back. There's a little section, and we're also adding it onto the, the patient information leaves the paper one. Um, yes, our clinic letters for car, like heart failure specifically and ICC, they're looking to kind of have a text, a, a section of text added on, just kind of saying um, kind of further information can be found um, at MedTap, um, and, and then giving the links of pa how patients can download it. Um, if any other areas, any other hospitals or teams are kind of interested about having something similar kind of added, we can share what we've written for here. Um, happy to do that. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments for Gail? It'd be, it'd be very interesting to know how many people actually knew about about this before Gail mm. spoke this afternoon. Just stick your hand up if you if you'd come across this before. Obviously, Susan had because she's the links with with the Bexley clinics. So, so not there's so, so so I don't think we've got anybody. Um, so what we'll do um, when I send out the um, the link to the recording of this, and Andy has shared his slides, so I will share those as well. Um, we'll also send links, Gail. Shall we? Well, we you know, as to how people can can download this and share this with their patients. Yeah, if you just search yes. in um, the App Store or kind of the Google Play Store, if you just type in MedTap, it should be one of the first options that come up. Um, but yeah, we can send around the actual links. Um, that's no problem of, of kind of how to download. Uh, we do have some QR codes. I don't know, people tend to be a bit more into QR codes now with COVID, but I think in general, most people are just quite happy to, to search and download. Any final thoughts or questions? So once again, Gail, really, really helpful, um, really good presentation, brilliant to see the app expanding. So I've sort of seen it grow over the last few years um, and it's starting to look really comprehensive and a really useful tool for the heart failure patients. So thank you. Um, so we've now got time for anybody to sort of raise anything that they'd like to either share with the group or to ask for support in any way. So there isn't anything else um, sort of really that we want to structure specifically, but this is an opportunity for people to, to share thoughts, questions, um, ask for ideas or, or support. And what I'll do is actually I'll start, I'll, I'll stop recording at this step at this stage um, so that people can can talk freely. So really it's, it's open to anybody now to raise anything that they might like to just get some support from, from your peers. <laughs> 